views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. All right, coming up on this edition of today's verdict, are you living in a no pet building but need the help of a service or companion animal? You have rights as a tenant and your landlord needs to make accommodations for you. On tonight's show, we steer you in the right direction. And are you musically inclined? Have you written or composed any pieces? If so, you will need to protect your work. How do you do that? Well, we will have an attorney on set to guide us through the area known as copyright law. As you can see, we have much to get to, so stay tuned. Today's verdict starts right now. Hello, and welcome to today's verdict, the live and interactive show that gives you your legal rights and options. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. Well, today's verdict is always encouraging you to stay connected. Make sure to tweet us at today's verdict and hashtag ask today's verdict if you have a question. Also, make sure to like us and follow us on Facebook at today's verdict and check us out at bronxnet.tv. When it comes to living in a no pet building, you still have rights to the help of a service or companion animal and standards in which can help you. Here to talk to us more about it is Moshe Bobker. Moshe, thanks for being here. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Uh, is it me or does it seem like more and more pets seem to be all around the uh, city of New York? Um, oh, my I, son even wants a pet. I think you're spot on. Uh, you know, if you've been in the subway recently, I think you've probably seen one or two, if not more, uh, dogs and cats in carriers or bags. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, man's best friend goes back right. uh, a long time, but I, I definitely think there's been a, 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 a large uptick. I saw a parrot yesterday, by the way, that um, we stopped to say hello to on <laughs> 76th Street in, uh, in Lexington. Um, let's talk a little bit about buildings, because that's really why you're here. Uh, there's co-ops, condos, and we really just have rentals also. Let's talk a little right. bit of the difference between a co-op and a condo, just to start us off, if you could. Sure. So uh, the difference between a co-op and a condo is whether you own the real property uh, associated with the apartment. Uh, a condo, you own the block and lot, you'll have it recorded online, uh, and you own the, the actual property, and as well as a percentage in the, in the common elements, which are like the hallways and things like that. Uh, in a co-op, you don't actually own any of the physical property. You own shares in a corporation that owns the property, and it entitles you to what's called a proprietary lease. Uh, that entitles you to, to rent the apartment, essentially. Right, and you have shares in the corporation. Correct. Um, a rental. Now, let's just talk about a typical rental. A lot of the Bronx sites, uh, and also people in Manhattan, uh, are just renting. Let's talk a little bit about that. We, what's, what's that involved? Sure. Just, just very basically. Sure. So a rental is just the, the uh, you know, a lease agreement. Uh, to, you're going to you know, rent an apartment. Uh, it could be a condo. It could be a house. It could be uh, any sort of apartment. But it's, it's the right th the, to occupy a specific apartment. All right. Let's talk about animals. All right. Let's say... Um, I have some type of issue where I would like my, um, my golden retriever uh, to be able to enter a building with me, even though my building has a no pet policy. What do I do? What can I do to start the process rolling? All right. So the first step would be to submit what's called a, a request for a reasonable accommodation to the buildings, either the landlord or the attorney, uh, usually whoever you'll, you'll pay your rent to uh, or your accommodation charges to, they'll be able to uh, you'll be your point person in the, in the first instance. You'll submit uh, essentially a request that demonstrates that you're entitled to, the, the, to, to keep the pet as an emotional support animal or a service animal. And maybe we should actually back up for a second. What is the difference? Service, emotional support. Sure. So a service animal is an animal that's been trained to perform a specific function. Uh, it, the, the prototypical example is a seeing eye dog. It acts as the person's uh, eyes uh, for all intents and purposes. An emotional support animal is not trained to do anything specific. Uh, or perform any specific uh, tasks, it's there to pr provide comfort, essentially. See, now, now he, he, here's, here's the issue for me. Service animals have always been there. They've been trained, they're properly trained, um, off-site, somebody else, it takes years, and sometimes if the service animal doesn't function up to the level they're supposed to function, they go into the regular community and somebody's lucky enough to adopt a beautiful animal who's very, very bright, but isn't bright enough to be a service animal. Emotional support animals, from what you're telling me, 
they don't get this type of training. Am I correct? Uh, generally correct. Uh, usually uh, buildings will require, even if they grant the request, it'll be, uh, you know, because of the reasonableness that, that's associated with it, they'll have the ability to put, put certain limitations on it. They can request, obviously, that the, uh, the pet is registered, uh, you know, with the, with the city of New York, if it's, you're in the city, that it gets vaccinated as appropriate, and that it's, it's trained appropriately so that it, there are no uh, accidents all over the right. building, essentially. Let's start with the easy one. That's the service animals, yes. right? Because, you, you know, you have a, an issue with your vision. Vision, um, or maybe your gait, whatever the issue are, but you have you have a service animal. Um, is it different in terms of your ability to have this particular animal than a, an emotional service uh, motion companion animal? Uh, yeah. So the, the the protections for a service animal are certainly greater uh, than an emotional support animal. Uh, for certain uh, for certain animals, uh, specifically with the, the uh, example of a blind person, if the disability is obvious, then the landlord doesn't have the opportunity or the ability to to look into it. They don't have the ability to question it. Uh, that's kind of that they have. What are the type of service animals, by the way, in, in terms of not just a vision or the, what 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 else is there? Uh, you can you have dogs that that can uh, uh, warn someone when they're they are uh, uh, they've got. Uh, uh, diabetes okay. or something like that they can oh, warn them oh, okay, sure. um, things like that uh, yeah I mean obviously I said the, the, the you know the, the blind person with the seeing eye dog yeah, is, is your typical easier. example and that's probably the most common All right, so it's tougher to fight that I would assume because if you're a landlord because you say hey, you know obviously the person really has a disability it's very obvious emotional right. support animals are a much different um, a genre how does that work? So yeah, so you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, an emotional support animal, it usually uh, it involves something a, with a mental health condition, uh, which is obviously a lot harder to diagnose and pinpoint because you're dealing with the you know the, the what's going on the, in the internal workings of the brain as opposed to uh, something that's obvious with a physical disability. Give me some examples of um, maybe clients you've represented or clients or you know you've represented landlords and you're going and you're preventing people from bringing certain animals and give me some examples of maybe these emotional support animals sure or cases maybe if you could sure so the you know, a common uh, example is people with anxiety uh, people with depression uh, and the the dog is not or the animal I should say is not really particularly trained to deal with the, the, the anxiety per se it's there to provide comfort and therefore there. allevi it alleviates the anxiety or the condition Right. All right. So let's say, you know, I, I suffer from some type of anxiety and I really need my particular pet, which, by the way, could be a, a cat sure. or, or a ferret. I don't know, whatever it is. That yeah. Do you need a psychiatrist, psychologist? Uh, what do you need? I mean, how does it work? Right. So for, in those cases, um, after you submit or, or part of the, the reasonable accommodation request, usually you have to uh, demonstrate with a, a mental health professional or a medical professional uh, with with uh, you know, essentially details, not the specific diagnosis necessarily, but information about the condition. Does does this mental health professional have to be your um, quote unquote therapist that you've had for years? It could be somebody that you just walk into a clinic and say, hey, you know, I'm not feeling too good. I'm being really anxious. I'm not getting a good night's sleep. Um, I'd like you to write out a letter telling me that my dog can come with me to my new apartment that doesn't allow pets. Uh, I Honestly, that's the, the, the latter uh, is probably why we have uh, so many reasonable accommodation requests and emotional support animals. Uh, it's, it's, it's become, you know, it's really proliferated the fact that you, you, know, you go to a, a doctor or a, a therapist, um, they see you maybe once or twice, and they're already prescribing an emotional support animal. And maybe I jump uh, the, the gun for uh, before, but who do you generally represent? A little of both? Uh, we, we generally represent buildings, uh, but we are obviously in, in the, we're trying to find the right people. We're, we're not trying to deny people right, their dogs. We're trying to find the right people that deserve them and, and make right, sure that they get Because obviously someone's need. watching, they're like, oh no, another landlord who's preventing me from bringing in a, an animal. But that's right. not really what you're, what you're about. Uh, no, we're just, we just want to make sure that the building is functioning as, it's, as appropriate. Because by the way, for, what, for every person who a lot of times wants to bring in an animal, there are 99 other people in the building who went into that building because it was a no pet building yeah, or may have allergies or issues. Correct. And that's something that's difficult for residents and board members alike to, to really wrap their head around is that they bought into a no pet building, like you said, on purpose. Maybe they have allergies. Maybe they're deathly afraid of dogs. Uh, it could be, you know, you have all the, if they, whatever the reasons might be, they bought into this building on purpose for that reason. So do you see that there seems to be an, uh, an an influx, an uptake of individuals who are trying to get their dogs or cats or somebody into a building 
and trying to just go around the law? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think. And I how think, do they do that? I think circumventing the law is, is, has become a big problem, and it's really made uh, boards and, and other people who are looking at these requests a little more skeptical about them. And, you know, it, it, we don't, you don't want to have it affect the people who really deserve these, these animals, but you can now go online. Uh, there are hundreds probably of sites you can go really? online and you quote unquote register your animal. Uh, you, uh, you, you input it, your information, the name of the pet, a picture of the pet, what your condition is, and it's not vetted in any way by a, a medical or, health or mental health professional, and it, it, it really is you kind of do it on your own and they send you a, uh, you know, a registration card, if so, you will. So, Moshe, what does a landlord do then in terms of taking the next step to, to, to make sure that there's no longer going to be this particular animal in the building. I mean, do you have to be proactive? Do you have to bring a petition? What, what do you do? Really? Well, you, you definitely have to be proactive as a landlord uh, because of there's a, a, a pet law waiver in New York City specifically uh, that if it's kept openly and notoriously for 90 days, so if you have the pet essentially for 90 days it's, and the landlord knows it goes, about it, stays. it, then you, no matter, right, without a reasonable accommodation or anything like that. So that's, you, you definitely have to be proactive as a landlord. Uh, when we, th we get these requests, we'll often start uh, either you know a notice to cure, which is in a co-op context, it says you're violating your lease because there's a no pet provision, uh, and you have to remove the dog. But we do it kind of with the proviso that we're going to review the reasonable accommodation request and, and to make that determination separately. Now, from what I understand, and tell me if I'm wrong, there's a new law in New York where there's some type of law that's really restricting your ability to be able to bring in emotional support animals. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's there there is a new law. I'm not I'm not familiar okay. with it. Uh, I haven't really dealt with it, uh, to be frank. But we, we've uh, had enough. I think what what I think from what I my understanding is there are many New Yorkers who have had enough with this of this, and people are carrying poodles in, into elevators that are having fights with, you know, with other animals, and then that's who's a real service animal, and the poodle just happened to be coming in to comfort the person for the day, and yeah. these are these seems to be uh, happening yeah. more often. Than Absolutely, not. I think this is really just the the backswing. We, we you know the law was was put in effect to, to permit people with uh, obviously with service animals and emotional support animals when they need them. Uh, I think the, you know, the, 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 the government really saw that it was being abused and this is really the swing back that's really trying to, to cut back on the, the, the unnecessary ones and, and, the, and are, the ones that are. Are judges understanding this in housing court? I mean, are they getting it? Uh, certainly. Uh, I mean, th this is something that, you know, housing court judges have seen, uh, you know, day in and day out. I wouldn't say day in and day out, but often. But they see it often. They see it all the time. Uh, often, you'll, you'll often see these uh, cases be brought uh, before one of the uh, government agencies that's, uh, that's, uh, that's mandated to, to investigate discrimination complaints. Any tips that you would give to somebody who's watching today and they, they want to get their, a service animal in the building? Uh, sure. I would say be uh, straightforward and upfront and, and, and act in good faith from the beginning. And, uh, and, and don't get the dog and then after they, you get a notice to cure or the landlord starts yelling at you, then you say, oh, it's, a, it's, it's an emotional support animal. And be most, upfront and, and most importantly, where do we find you? Uh, my, you can contact me by phone at 212-766-4000. Uh, I'm at extension 108. You can visit our website. It's TWW.NYC. And my email is M-B-O-B-K-E-R at TWW.NYC. Good stuff. And you'll come back? Absolutely. Whenever you like. That's what I like. All right. We have to take a quick break, but don't worry. We'll be back with more today's verdict right after this. neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart is a sea race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family.
How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. Welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host, David Lesh. We are always encouraging you to stay connected. Tweet us at today's verdict. As a songwriter, writing lyrics and composing music isn't the only thing you have to worry about. There is also issues regarding copyright, credit, and royalties. Well, we'll learn more about music law with attorney Ralph Gabri. Ralph, this, first of all, this topic is fascinating to me because I know nothing about it. Um, and it's not the type of thing that's ever in my wheelbarrow, so we're really happy to have you on here today. Um, let's talk about music generally nowadays. When yeah. growing up, it was you hit it, you got it on the radio, you made it. Right. It's not that way anymore. No, no. Now it's, it's funny. <laughs> it, it changes. It's changing almost daily at this point, right? And even, even uh, five years ago, it was all about downloads. Everybody downloading music. Now that's gone, and now it's all about streaming. Now, now you ver you hardly even have a, uh, an actual copy of a song anymore. And now you're just streaming to it to Spotify, right? Or yeah, Spotify. And, and there's also like there's this Apple's coming out with a new service. And there's yeah. a YouTube, and yep. I guess there's Google even Play, a lot yeah. of different places. Right. right. Yeah. So, if you're lucky enough to start getting your music there, we'll get there in a second. Let's yeah. talk first about just composing the music. Sure. Right. So let's say it, it's you and me, right? You and I, how do you want to say writing it? A, writing some We're music. writing something. Yeah, it's, okay. uh, it's Lennon and McCartney, okay? We've got right. some ideas, you and I, and we're stop. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm harmonizing, and you got the guitar, sure. we're going back and forth. Um, now we think we have a song, all right? Who gets credit for this? Yeah, we you, me, both, how does it work? Well, we, we should talk about that. We should, we should have open communication about all how right. we want to set that up. Um, you know, I've been tangentially involved in some disputes Right. Among songwriters, uh, not not representing the songwriters, but being uh, representing the distribution company, the digital distribution company, and giving evidence to their case amongst themselves. Because when you, get, especially when you get a lot of people involved, it can get complicated. If it's just two people, that's easy. That's pretty easy. Although it, it I think Lennon McCartney still had issues later it, on, you yeah. know, and there were only two of them. Right. Um, right. When you know egos get big and whatnot. Yeah, okay. Especially. And, and yeah. so so now it expands a little bit. You got somebody who's got a says, oh, you know what, I, you should strum this particular tune, you know, yeah. this particular, you know, chorus or something. How do you determine, how are you splitting it up at this point? Yeah. Especially years from that, then, the, the, it goes to number one, and right. we're, t we're talking millions of dollars, and somebody says, hey, wait a second, that, that, those three words were my words. Yeah, and that happens. It that has to happen. That happens. Um, and that, that, that's even another issue as to, you know, how much of a song can you sample, um, are you sampling off of the written composition, or are you sampling off of the recording? And by the, the way, the, maybe backing yeah. up, why why yeah. is it important? What, what what are we talking about here? What's the difference between royalties and and or monies that are paid to you by a publishing company? Like how does it, how does it work? Here? It's really in the music industry. It's very granular, and there's 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 you know copyrights are, are often referred to as a bundle of rights, and there's it's a bundle of little of sticks, separate sticks. All those different sticks can be pulled out and separately owned by different people, licensed in different ways, so it can get really complicated. Um, and in a situation where you've got um, people writing the song and you have a different person who's in the studio with you and helping you produce it. Sampling it or, or, you, or, or mixing yeah, or the music Yeah, or telling you do this around. a little bit different. Right. So you'll have like a song, you can have people have songwriting credits, you can have somebody have a production credit. Okay, you can have an in, you got in, engineer. There's all these different credits people okay, can Okay, so have. now you, you, you're putting this all together. Yeah. Does it have to be on a piece of paper or something for it to be valid now? Because that's the way it used to be, right? You had to need a sheet of music and you stamp it, but does it, does it have to be in some kind of tangible form for you to get a copyright on it? Or just can you just sing it and say, oh, that's mine? Can't you hear it? 
Well, it has to be to, to have it be protected by copyright. It has to be it has to be reduced to to a, to a, some sort of medium. Some type of medium. What does exactly. that mean, really? It's got it's got to because I, I read that and I wasn't too sure what that right, means. Right, right. So if you're writing sheet music, it's you have to literally have written it on the page or okay. in your computer or saved as a data file. On your but computer. what if you you dictate it, you know, and you and you just you put it on a little microphone and then you. Boom! You put it right onto YouTube. Is that a medium at this that point? That is a medium. It's that a medium. medium. Yeah, that, yeah. Now that's not a composition, though, necessarily. Okay. But it is a audiovisual work. Gotcha. And so yes, that that's a separate type of copyright. All right. And it, in the music industry, it's interesting because you'll have you can have a separate copyright for the written sheet right. music. That's the composition. All right. You can have a separate copyright on the sound recording. Okay. And in fact, an interesting that a lot of people don't know about is that. Um, there's compulsory licensing for sound recording. What does that in mean? Music. So that means so that means once you record uh, a record, then anybody else can cover that and record their own version of it. Okay. They so and they, and you have they to, to let pay, them, to but they have to pay. Oh, but they're allowed to. But they're allowed to. Really? You, you can't stop them. In I fact. didn't know that. Yeah, you cannot so, stop them. So, right. but they if, have to pay. If Weird Al yeah. Yankovic wants to go and take yeah. a Prince record and or a Madonna record. Madonna or Prince can't say no. Right. Can't say no. Right. But they'll say you got to pay me. Now there it's a little bit different too because he's you know he there he's also the parody. Al there he's also altering the song. Yes, you have the parody okay. First Amendment issue. Uh, that's making it a little hard. But, okay, so let's say they're not altering the song. Like a good example of this is, um, you know, uh, let me think of a good song that was that was it's been covered. You know, there's there's certain classic songs that have been covered many times. Um, I would like to think of a Beatles song that's been covered many times, but I don't think anybody's yeah, really by, taken it. Yeah, but by like other artists. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm sitting here on camera and I can't. That's all right. <laughs> okay. But, but, well, all right. So, but, so we, we, we can a, all think of those examples. We can sing a song, pick a yeah. song that someone's been taken. Yeah. And I want your song, the Kenny. Look a little Kenny Rogers there. You look a little like Kenny Rogers. I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, lady, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I want, I want, uh, lady, yeah. right? So <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna start singing lady and stuff yeah. playing it, right? Like, yeah, and that's fine. You're allowed. Hear, yeah, you're allowed to do that. I'm allowed to do that. Yes. Do I say, uh, by the way, Kenny, um, how much, how much you want? Well, that's so. There's two ways to do it. There's, there's a, there are set standard rates that are set by the industry, okay, or you can negotiate directly with the songwriter. Okay, to oh. try to get maybe a better rate or a better deal. But there's a standard rate. There is, but there's a standard rate, yes. But you can try to beat it. You can try to come and okay. come and do a special individual deal. Do, yeah. do songwriters just generally like to have their music covered by somebody else? Or, or I know, you know, yeah. Springsteen's taken it, it, some other, a lot of people absolutely. have taken Springsteen's music. Ab it, you, right. know, um, right. you know, it, it kind of goes from generation to generation. Then you have somebody like Aerosmith who took a little bit of the... Uh, or the Beastie Boys who took a little bit of Aeros. I don't know. Those things are all That's over. That's right. I get. I get. Yeah. A, I get a little bit mixed up. Right. Um, okay. So now let's say you have yourself a song and you're ready to go. Do you get the lawyer before you go to the publishing company? Like, what do you? What's the? Yes. What's the standard? <laughs> That's to a go? good idea. Yeah, because you want to be careful about um, what you're negotiating away, possibly. If you're if you're a young songwriter, you're just starting out. And what are the type of things you can it's, negotiate it's, away? It's it's going to be it's going to be difficult. You're not going to have much leverage to uh, per, you know to keep from the your typical uh, songwriting contract is going to you're going to be signing away the copyright um, and oftentimes uh, the administration right on the song. There's different rights, uh, but you might still get 50 percent of certain royalties. So you you. You want to have a lawyer there to, to give you a little you know extra oomph and, and let you know exactly what's going on with because I think an song. artist you know when they you know they 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 put so much effort into their right. work they just want people to hear it and they don't understand that this is there's a financial component here right. and these publishing companies are not there because they like you no they're, they're there to make money they're there to make money right. they want your right. song to make right. money not That's because exactly they right. like you That's right. Um, all right, so you get yourself an attorney. What's the attorney do? Do they do they prepare a contract with the publishing company, or do they reach out to the publishing company, or how does I mean how does it even work? Yeah, so the attorney can recommend different publishing companies depending on what type of music it is, uh, what what uh, you know whether it's an indie, more of like an indie based, uh, indie angled company versus a you know big huge established company that's multinational. Um, uh, so it really depends on the genre, on, you know, are you a new songwriter, is, is this, you know, are you established? You know, this is interesting, at least for me it is. Apparently there are certain organizations, they listen 
to everything and to see if your song is being played. Yeah. And then they let you know and they get That's you money. Right. Those are called performing rights organizations. Right. There's three of them. What is that about? So there's ASCAP, uh, CSAC, and BMI. And um, is that like a bar association you join as an attorney? I don't understand. How does that well, work? Well, they're, they're performing rights organizations. So every artist can choose which of the three they want their songs to go into, okay? And then that organization, you're right, they they will, uh, they have these algorithms that they use. Oh, so that's how they use it. That's yeah, how they do it. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's like a statistical Because I mean, how would you analysis. know if somebody's... Yeah, they don't know exactly, but they, they've got these, like, statistical analysis that they do as to what kind of airplay the song is getting, you know, in different types do of venues. Do most people join whatever. these organizations? Well, you really have, you, you should, yes. You should. I yeah. mean, obviously, because yeah. if somebody's... Because you want to get paid, because th their job is to get you money. I assume they take a cut as well. Exactly. Right. Yes. They is it do. a cut, or is, yeah. is it, or is, or is it just you're, you're paying to join? But whatever. They, no, no. It's a cut. They, they, it's, it's a it's cut. Yeah. It's literally a cut of the royalty. Yeah. All right. Let's talk right. about yeah. some tips. All right. Someone's yeah. watching now, you know, and uh, yeah, they put together a little musical piece. I told you years back. I did. I had to for right. for, for a class and had to sing it, and um, I'm not very proud of it. But you I did. Are you gonna sing it right now? No, I won't sing it. Oh, I won't okay. sing it. You know, <laughs> I, I don't, that's one thing I won't do. But I never copyrighted it. You know, I compose it on the piano. I, you know, musically I compose it and the words, and it just sits in a file in my in, at home. Since what I've year? Been like about not to. I don't want to make. I'll, date, I'll but okay, like I'll about tell you what year was, was that? It, 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 it was the depends. summer of 1981. I'll tell you exactly when it was. Okay. Yeah, it was a six-week yeah. course. You had to compose. A musical, uh, um, you had to compose it. I, I used the piano. Other people in the class used other instruments. Yeah. And you had to sing it. So I had to create words and sing it. I never copyrighted. Is that still mine? Is it an automatic copyright? You know, it's funny. What happened to that? If you had done that in 19, I believe it was 86 or okay. after, um, by virtue of the amendments that had been done to the Copyright Act, actually in, in uh, 1976, to comply with international treaties, if it was 86 or after, you would have automatically had a copyright that was oh. born in that and owned by you. Even if you hadn't registered it, you'd still... But prior you'd, to 86, it's not but prior, It's a little... Then, then it's it's more complicated. Then there's issues with whether you put a copyright notice and there's all these other, there's all these other technical things you had to comply with. That all went away in the late 80s. Yes. And now, as soon as you complete your work, you automatically are deemed to own... That, that's the moment a copyright is actually born. Oh, okay. well, a lot they, of musicians they, are complaining nowadays that they, that they just don't have... You know, power over their music. I mean, I guess musicians always complain that you know the radio stations weren't playing it enough. Or, yeah. but now that people feel that that the the companies, the record companies, or whoever it is, just has all the control. I mean, is that that's changing though? It's changing because of all the the mediums, the mediums, yeah, and uh, digital streaming and whatnot. Yeah, Listen, most important thing yeah. for a new artist is where do we find you? Where do you find? Okay, yeah. uh, I'm with Cox Padmore School in Lincoln, Chicago. All right. Uh, phone number two one two nine five three six six three three. Uh, you can visit our website, www.cpsslaw. And the most important thing, see a lawyer before yeah, you, you really get should. this out to anybody else, yeah, right? Yeah, Protect yeah, it. Yeah, Keep, so you don't sign away all your rights. Good stuff, Ralph. You come back. I sure will. Thanks right. for having me. That's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us and, of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you missed any part of today's show, be sure to check it out at www.brunksnet.tv. Also remember, if there is a legal issue or topic you'd like to see on a future edition of Today's Verdict, feel free to contact me at David Lesh at bronxnet.org or tweet us at Today's Verdict and make sure to hashtag Ask Today's Verdict. For myself and all of us at Today's Verdict, always remember, know your rights, know your issues, reach a verdict. We'll see you next time. So, um